I am really, really happy to introduce our panelists for today. They're coming to us from Titulia, which is a really wonderful business. Um, I love the way Titulia kind of hits all the pieces of our mission statement, which is good, clean, and fair food for all. If you're not familiar with Slow Foods, Slow Food is an international grassroots organization that began in Italy 30 years ago, and that's our mission. And everything we do around the world in the 150 countries that we're present in take a little bit of a different shape depending on the culture and the context and the world that it's happening in. But the mission for all of our entities around the world is good, clean, and fair food for all. So today on Slow Food Live, we have Macy and Susan. Macy is the digital media marketing manager. I'm sorry, I might have jumbled that up a little, Macy, for Titulia. And Susan is the manager at T-Bar in Denver. So I'm gonna hand this over to Macy to tell us a little bit more about Titulia uh, and what makes Titulia so unique and such a great business. And then we'll turn it over to Susan to teach you how to make kombucha. Thank you both so much for being here. We're really grateful for your time and happy to have you. So Macy, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Giselle. We're excited to be here and share more about Titulia and our story and then ask Susan to teach us more about kombucha. Um, so my name is Macy Howard. Um, I do all the digital marketing and e-commerce for Titulia. Um, I've been with Titulia for about five years and I'm here stepping in for Linda, our CEO and co-founder today um, to share really what makes us unique um, before Susan steps in. Um, so Titulia is based in Denver, Colorado. Um, we sell nationwide in food service and retail and in my commerce or my channel e-commerce. Um, we also sell in bulk to kombucha brewers, breweries, and other tea brands. Um, and what really makes us unique is that we're one of the only tea companies that actually own our own tea garden. Um, our garden is in the north of Bangladesh. And sort of like wine and coffee, it really matters where tea is grown. Um, and the soil is grown in and the amount of sunlight and elevation and the rain, um, all those factors um, really affect the flavor profile. And Northern Bangladesh is really perfect. Um, the environment's really perfect for growing tea. Uh, most tea brands source from all over the world. So it's really hard to control all those elements. So you don't really know um, the garden that it's being grown in. Another thing that's really important for tea is organic. Most people don't think about this, but tea can't be washed before it goes into your cup. It's plucked and dried or fired or steamed, depending on the tea variety. Um, actually, all tea comes from a single tea plant, Camellia sinensis, but the way it's dried is how you get a green or black or white or oolong tea um, and the varying caffeine content goes along with that. Um, but anyway, since it can't be washed, um, since you'd be brewing the tea, um, all those chemicals or whatever is sprayed on the leaves that they're growing ends up in your tea cup. So our garden is 100% organic. And what's even cooler than that is that we're not just sustainable, um, but what we're doing is actually regenerative. Our co-founder, Anis Ahmed, um, is from Bangladesh. And when he and his family discovered the land that our garden is now on, it was this barren wasteland um, that was destroyed by rock lifting. So he and his family implemented natural farming methods from Japanese master Mansuobu Fukunakwa, I pronounced that right, um, which is basically um, that nature knows best and to let nature do, do its thing to restore itself. Um, no irrigation or chemicals um, and several bodies of water that had just dried up due to the rock lifting and animals that had gone extinct from the region came back. And it's now this lush, beautiful garden um, that we have, we have today. Um, and we still use practices um, we're almost completely closed everything we use and recycle everything that has grown um, so one example is that we have neem trees that are used um, in the garden um, to shade the tea plants um, they act as a natural pesticide to keep bugs away since we use no chemicals and then we use the leaves um, in a neem tea that we create and sell um, what I love about Titulia is that every aspect is so, so thoughtfully done um, from our garden to our packaging. We're really treating the land the best way that we can. Um, so we're not taking any shortcuts and we can be totally transparent about what we're doing, what we're doing because um, we're really doing it right. Um, another way that we're closed loop and that I find the most amazing thing about our garden is our cattle lending program. Um, well, let me back up. So one of the reasons our tea garden was started was to provide jobs to the impoverished region of Bangladesh. 
especially to the women um, who are most often the tea bookers. Um, our founders believe that providing um, jobs for these women so they can work and provide an education for themselves to lift themselves out of poverty was much better than providing just money for a couple meals. Um, so not only do we provide jobs at the garden to pluck the tea leaves, um, but we pay for the women to leave a couple times a week to attend schools to learn basic skills like how to read and write and count, um, something that they don't have access to. Um, so during one of the trips to the garden, we met, a, we met a woman who said that she was so grateful to learn how to count because she realized that she was getting shortchanged at the market every week and she didn't know because she didn't know how to count. So now she, she um, is spending for herself. Um, we also hear from the women all the time that they're so excited that they can finally make big purchases for themselves because they know how to sign their names and they don't have to rely on their husbands to sign for them. Um, and they're finally making a salary for themselves and for their families. Um, one of our greatest initiatives is our cattle lending program, back to that. Um, so we grow, to grow all 2,000 acres of tea and without chemicals, we need a way to enrich the soil. Um, and a great way to do that is with cow manure. Um, but we're not in the business of raising cows. So what the Ahmed family did, Ahmed family is um, the Bangladeshi co-founders, um, is yeah, loan the women who work in the community cows or who live in the community. Um, so the women raise the cows in their homes and each week they provide a set amount of milk and cow dung that we use for our garden. Um, and they get to keep a portion of the milk to sell or to, to feed their families. Um, after the loan is paid off, it takes about two years. They can keep the cow and during that period they can keep any calves that the cow may have. Um, I recently got the opportunity to go to Bangladesh and we met with several women who are part of this program and got to hear their stories. And this has really changed thousands of families' lives in Bangladesh. So many of the, hus the women's husbands have actually quit their jobs to work for their wives and tend to the cows because they're making more money for the family, which is really unheard of in Bangladesh. Um, but I really love hearing about that the women have become empowered to take control of their own lives and they have the opportunity to work and to send their kids to school and provide a job, um, better, provide a better life for their family. Um, and they were so excited to share that, which was pretty amazing. Um, there was one family that had a two bedroom home and one room is where the family lived and the other room was set up for the cow. The cow lived there, had its own fan because the cow was really what was making the money um, for this family, so it gets the best treatment. So that's our garden. Um, because of the farming methods and because our tea comes directly from our garden, rather than sitting in a warehouse where it's waited to be blended or sold to a tea company. Um, it's really the freshest tea um, out there. Um, and because our tea is so good and pure on its own, um, it's really, most of our teas have only one ingredient, which is the tea itself. Um, we don't need to add in any other ingredients that sometimes can be used to cover up any bitterness or um, any imperfections. And we know that tea can be really in intimidating to a lot of people. Um, so we like to be a bit more casual with our brewing than um, some other tea brands out there. We don't worry about ultra precise water temperature or exact timing. And we really encourage our customers to kind of play around with it. Um, my favorite way to brew is cold brewing. Um, I just add a couple tea bags to my water bottle, let it steep for about 15 minutes. Um, and it's even more smooth that way. Um, hot water is really what brings out some of the bitter tannins in tea. Um, and it has also even more antioxidants when you brew it cold rather than hot. Um, we also launched a line of canned tea soda. It's a fizzy tea soda with um, real tea and real fruit ingredients. Um, they're really amazing and make a great cocktail mixer. So that's my favorite. Um, we also just came out with a wellness pack. Um, tea is really great for build, boosting your immunity and for um, helping you sleep and relieving anxiety. And so we created a pack. Um, that includes a variety of six different teas and a guide on how to use tea to, for your health. Um, and also every pack that is purchased, we we'll donate another pack to a healthcare worker or a healthcare facility that's in need, which they can really use the immunity support and the um, anxiety relieving teas right now. Um, so unlike our, so their garden, that's the half is our garden and the other half is our packaging. Um, our packaging is carefully created to leave the most minimal impact possible. We don't use strings or tags or staples on our tea bags to cut back on the amount of waste that we're using. Um, and our tea bags and our canisters and our wrappers are compostable. So we're really treating 
um, the land with the really the most respect that we can. Um, so that's a real high level of Tetulia. There's a lot that makes this special, so there's a lot to tell. Um, but really what we're all about is doing things better for the, for the people and for the land. Excellent. Thank you so much, Macy. That's really wonderful. I'm happy to know a little more. If anybody has a question about Tetulia or anything that Macy just mentioned, you can throw it into this Q&A at any time. It doesn't have to be right this moment. Um, and Macy, if it sounds good to you, we'll now turn over to Susan. Mm -hmm. um, Susan manages a tea bar, and the tea bar is a Tetulia uh, brick and mortar. Is that right? It's sort of Tetulia's space. Yeah. Excellent. So Susan, do we have you with us still? see. There you are. <laughs> Great. Susan, welcome. Um, maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about yourself and then we'll jump into your tutorial, your demo. Hi, I'm Susan. Um, I'm the manager over at the Tea Tulia Tea Bar in Colorado, Denver. Um, our tea bar is really unique. Uh, it's essentially a, a test kitchen. We're able to use our teas and um, try fun drinks. Uh, our tea sodas were actually created in tea bar, which is really cool. Um, we've been dabbling in bubble teas lately, which has been really fun. Um, just overall, it's, uh, it's a really great company to work for. Um, it feels good to be providing product that we know exactly where it's coming from and what's in it, what's in it. So... Excellent. Can you tell us where it's located and what you guys are up to now that you can't be open in the normal way that you usually are? So we are still technically open. We're just um, carry out only. We're um, in Denver, Colorado. It's uh, in the Highlands area, closer to downtown Denver. Um, right now we have this, uh, our space is, um, it used to be a garage. So we have this um, awesome space and we just put up our garage door and we've just been serving everything through there, which most people have been very receptive to. Excellent, that's great. Awesome, well, if you're ready, we'll play this demo. Stephanie has, I'm sorry, Susan, I was just talking to somebody named Stephanie earlier today. Susan has pre-recorded so she could be in her sort of maker space and do this um, for you. I'm gonna switch over to the video if that sounds good to you, Susan. Perfect. Great, and we'll get going. So this is your demo on how to make kombucha. Um, it's a, just a little over 20 minutes. If you have questions during the demo, please put them in the Q&A and then as soon as it's done, we'll ask those questions to Susan. Hello, I'm Susan and I run the cafe over at Tea Tuli Tea Bar in Denver, Colorado. And today we are going to go over the first fermentation process of home brewing kombucha. For those of you who aren't familiar with kombucha, it is a fermented tea. It can be served still or sparkling, usually at the grocery store, it's sparkling. Um, kombucha is a uh, probiotic beverage that promotes gut health. It contains live cultures, and it's also known to be a good detoxifying beverage. People find brewing kombucha to be intimidating, but it's actually very easy. Essentially, it is just a fermented sweet tea. Um, we're going to go over some of the ingredients that you need to brew kombucha at home. You're going to need a stirring spoon, a, what, at least one gallon wide mouth glass vessel, a gallon of filtered water, get into that later. Of course you're going to need your teas. You use about six bags of black tea and six bags of green tea. Organic cane sugar. Some starter tea. And then a scoby. Let's focus on the SCOBY for a little bit, little SCOBY 101. So in order to make kombucha, you have to have a SCOBY. SCOBY stands for Symbiotic Colony of Bacteria in Yeast. It is what ferments the sweet tea into kombucha. Um, 
You always want to have clean hands when handling a SCOBY. So this is what it looks like. A little rubbery, very fragile. Pour a little bit of this starter tea in here. All starter tea is, is a sweetened tea that's already been fermented. You also need that in order to make kombucha. So the SCOBY is a little temperamental. You don't want it to get too hot. So you don't want it to go above 80 degrees. You also do not want for it to get too cold. You don't want it to go under 40 degrees. The reason being, if it gets too hot, with the SCOBY being a live culture, it will die and your tea may not ferment properly. And if it gets too cold, the fermentation process stops. And then, again, your tea won't ferment properly. All right, let's get to the good stuff. Let's start brewing our kombucha. So I have a hot plate back here. The pot, and we are gonna start brewing some tea. I have a cup of filtered water here. Just gonna pour it into the pot. Oil for a second. So you always want to use filtered water when brewing kombucha. The reason being is tap water has traces of chlorine and other impurities in it and your SCOPY needs pure filtrated water to stay healthy. So always, always, always use filtered water. Um, a little trick that I do is I boil water ahead of time and then I will let it sit and rest at room temperature and then there you go, free filtered water. Um, another ingredient that you need is your tea. I use six bags of black tea and six bags of green tea for my kombucha blends. People ask all the time if the tea that you use matters. Personally, I think it does because you don't want a tea that has, you know, pesticides or chemicals. Um, in my opinion, organic is the best way to go. You are consuming this into your body. Um, the reason why tea tulia teas are so great is all of our teas are organic. We grow them in Bangladesh. Um, we don't use any chemicals or pesticides when growing our teas. Uh, we don't use, as you can see, any strings or tags or staples on our tea bags. And our tea bags themselves are compostable. They're made out of corn silk. Corn silk. Sorry. So. Um, you can find our teas um, on teatulia.com's website. We have loose leaf bag tea. Either one will work. Um, I just find using tea bags to be a little easier when brewing kombucha. So I'm going to put six tea bags of black. And then six tea bags of the Teetulia green tea. Black and green tea are usually the best blends when you first start out with home brewing. Um, the SCOBY responds really well to the tannins when fermenting. Another ingredient that you need is going to be sugar. I always recommend organic cane sugar. Now, it doesn't have to be um, it doesn't have to be cane sugar. It could be any organic sugar, but it has to be real sugar. It cannot be any 
um, Splendas or Stevias. Um, I know somebody who makes it with um, coconut sugar. Um, again, uh, organic is always best. Um, the whole point of kombucha is that it's good for you and you want to keep your ingredients pretty, pretty pure. So you put in a cup of organic cane sugar. Give it a stir. I know that um, in previous classes that I have done, people are concerned about the amount of sugar that goes into brewing kombucha. Uh, the sugar is just for the, uh, it's for the SCOBY itself. It's how the fermentation process is made. The SCOBY will feed on the sugar and uh, that's how it ferments. So when people see, oh, that's a lot of sugar, I usually just let them know that the sugar is to feed the SCOBY. It goes to the SCOBY and not, not to you. By the time your tea is fermented, there is very little sugar in there. I'm gonna close this. And we're gonna brew it for about seven to 10 minutes. And while the tea is brewing, I'm gonna go over a few frequently asked questions about brewing kombucha. Um, and then of course, if I miss any of your questions, please uh, ask in the message boards and I will respond as I can. So most people want to know uh, just how important the starter tea is with the SCOBY. Um, it's pretty important. Um, kind of similar to yogurt, in order to make yogurt, you need to have a little bit of another uh, yogurt with live probiotics. Um, it's the same thing, essentially, with the fermentation process with kombucha. Uh, typically, uh, anywhere between one to two cups of starter tea is all you'll need. And it's pretty easy to find um, whoever, when you get your SCOBY, whether it's uh, from a friend who does home brewing or you get it online, um, they'll typically come with starter tea. It's, um, I like to do about two cups, just better safe than sorry. It also will speed up the fermentation process a little bit. Um, usually after your, your kombucha is um, fermented, it takes about anywhere from five to seven days. Um, once it hits past those dates, um, if the SCOBY doesn't have enough sugar, to keep it going, it turns a little vinegary. So usually after about four or five days, I start tasting it every day to get it to that sweet spot of my personal preference. Some people like it a little sweeter, some like it a little more vinegary, that is gonna be a personal preference. But I usually like it where it is right on the cusp of being vinegary, but not, not quite there yet. Um, Another question I get is, is kombucha gluten-free? It is. Um, it also is vegan if you don't add any honey to the second fermentation process. Um, another really popular question that I get is if, uh, let's give this a stir. is if you can refrigerate your SCOBY. Um, as you can see, I have a lot of them. Um, with every batch that you make of kombucha, you also get another SCOBY. It will grow at the top. And the answer to that is you never, ever want to refrigerate your SCOBY. Um, as um, we discussed earlier, it will slow down the fermentation process and then it, it becomes uh, kind of useless if your tea isn't fermenting. Um, so anything under 40 degrees you don't want. Best practice with uh, your SCOBYs are to keep them in a SCOBY hotel. So every time I get a new one, I put it in a jar with fermented tea and I just keep it in a, uh, a cool spot. Uh, your cupboard is a good spot. Um, anywhere out of direct sunlight is great. Um, 
just, you know, don't put it in the refrigerator. Let's check on our tea. It's almost ready. I'm just gonna let it brew for a little bit longer. Um, another common question that I get about home brewing kombucha is if you have to add the sugar. Um, yes, sugar is very important to the fermentation process. As I discussed earlier, the SCOBY needs it in order to uh, ferment the kombucha. Um, again, don't worry about how much you're putting in. Um, the, 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 the sugar typically just kind of dissolves into the SCOBY and it doesn't, you have very little sugar by the time you hit your second fermentation process. Um, another question that I get is if you can brew with decaf tea, absolutely. It doesn't have to be a, a caffeinated black. Um, I've actually brewed some kombuchas where it didn't have um, any caffeine. It does not affect the quality of your brew. So, I'm going to start taking these tea bags out. There's many glass vessels out there. This is just the one that I use. Um, you might find that you like the ones that have the spouts a little bit better. It makes it better for tasting your kombucha as it's fermenting. Um, but you can find glass vessels anywhere. Um, I would recommend getting a glass jar. Um, you don't want to use plastic. Uh, or ceramics, um, glass is typically uh, the best. Enough sunlight can get into it. Um, you don't have to worry about the SCOBY clinging on to particles from plastic. Um, you can find them basically anywhere, um, online, at your grocery store. And then, because you don't want your SCOBY to get too warm, I have a little cheat where I only, out of the one gallon of water, I only brew four cups. I make it very concentrated, and then I mix it with the cold water. That way you don't have to wait several hours for your tea to cool before putting your SCOBY in. So I have my three quarts of room temperature filtered water. I'm going to pour it into the jar. And then my concentrated sweetened tea. Probably pour just a little bit. more just so the starter tea can fit. That's good. Okay. And the 
jar. It's cool to the touch. It's perfect. So I don't have to worry about damaging the SCOBY. Here is my starter tea. It's about two cups. And again, starter tea is just um, fermented tea. It's really easy to get. Pour that in there. Then we are going to add the SCOBY. you have it, the first fermentation process of brewing kombucha. You want to cover this with either a breathable cloth or um, a coffee filter, works just fine. And then, rubber band, and then you put this in a cool dry place away from direct sunlight. Um, a little sunlight is good, but you just don't want it to be in direct sunlight because again, you don't want your SCOBY to get too warm. Um, but you just let this sit anywhere from five to seven days. I usually start testing it uh, about four days in. Uh, just give it a little sip, see how it tastes. And you pull the SCOBY out once you have hit the flavor profile that you like. So once you your kombucha is ready and you're happy with its flavor, you just open this guy back up and you stick your hand in, you grab the SCOBY, you stick it in your SCOBY hotel and grab two cups, always remember to grab two cups of the fermented starter tea and put it in your other vessel with your SCOBYs. That way you can brew more kombucha and you don't have to worry about finding more starters somewhere else. All right, so just a recap of what we just did. Wrap this guy back up. Okay, so in order to make kombucha for the first fermentation process you need a either a, a pot to boil stove top um, kettles work just fine you need a stirring spoon can't forget about your tea um, again organic is always best if you're interested in trying our teas, you can find them on teetulia.com. Filtered water is everything. Um, always filtered. <laughs> Can't stress that enough. Um, you need a gallon of filtered water, a gallon glass vessel, one cup of organic cane sugar, and of course your SCOBY and two cups of the fermented starter tea. And that's really all you need to do the first fermentation of kombucha. Some of this out of the way. Now, a lot of people have questions about how to store your SCOBY after you have finished brewing. It's very simple. With every batch of kombucha that you brew, another SCOBY will form. So with this in about five to seven days, another SCOBY will form at the top of this vessel, and then you will have two SCOBYs. Best practice is to take two cups of the starter tea, put it in the vessel, take the SCOBY out, also put it in the vessel, 
and then mix a little bit of sweetened tea into the starter tea, kind of like you're brewing, but it's just to keep your SCOBY healthy. Um, SCOBYs do not go bad, but they do, again, they can't get too hot, they can't get too cold, and you want to continuously feed it sweetened tea in order to keep it healthy. Um, but you just store this in a cool, dry place, and you can start making multiple batches with your SCOBYs or give them to friends. Um, it's uh, The hardest part is getting a SCOBY in the beginning, and then once you start brewing, you will see that you end up with a lot of them. That's it. That's really all there is to getting through the first fermentation of brewing kombucha at home. It's essentially just a sweetened tea with a little bit of fermented tea and your SCOBY. Um, I do want to point out that once this is ready in five to seven days, it is uh, a still tea. Um, in the grocery store, your kombuchas are typically carbonated. Um, in order to get a carbonated kombucha, you have to go into the second fermentation process. Um, in a brief explanation of how to do that is you would grab either slingback bottles or the same bottles that you get at the store when you buy kombucha will also work. And then you just take your filter, um, your fermented kombucha and you mix it with either fresh fruit or fruit juice, any flavor you want. Um, herbs are okay too. And then you will cover that and put it in a cool dry place. Um, again, not in the fridge for about anywhere from two to three days and the tea will feed off of the sugar from the fruit or the fruit juice and that is how the carbonation comes to be. Um, of course this class is just to get you through the first fermentation. I personally like it without the carbonation but I know many home brewers who will take the time and you, for the extra few days to do the second fermentation. If you have any questions about how to get your kombucha carbonated, um, feel free to ask and I will answer them as they come. All right, and that's it. I hope you enjoyed learning how to do the first fermentation of homebrew kombucha as much as I did teaching y'all. Please don't hesitate to ask any questions and I will do my best to answer them all. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Susan. That is great and has gotten me excited to try again. I'm one of those that I tried and <laughs> now I feel a little better equipped to try again. So Susan's been in our Q&A answering lots of your questions, which is great because there are a lot of great questions. So we'll spend the, the last little bit of this session getting to the rest of the questions. So Susan, I don't know if there are a few in there that sort of jump out to you or I can pull some of these out. Um, one thing that I think is a good place to start maybe is um, what is the kombucha supposed to taste like? So when you're tasting it throughout the process, um, what are you looking for? What, what's a good thing? What's a bad thing? So um, that's more of a preference per person. Um, initially, when you first make the kombucha, it's going to be um, very sweet. It's going to be essentially just a sweet tea. As a few days go by, you'll start to taste it. It'll be a little, it'll still be sweet, but it'll be a little tangy. And then um, uh, the more that you wait, the more vinegary it will get. Now, um, one thing I didn't say in the video is there, do, it, there comes a point where the kombucha is too vinegary to drink. Um, you can usually tell, you can smell it. It just smells like vinegar. That's just the fermentation process. Um, Sometimes it happens to the best of us. Um, it's hard to check on it every single day. Um, when that happens, I usually just transfer it into a bottle and use it as cleaning vinegar and then just start over. Um, but the uh, starter tea is essentially just, it's, um, 
it's kombucha that's gone too far. So it's perfect. It's perfectly safe to use to make more kombucha, but I wouldn't necessarily drink it if it smells and tastes like vinegar. Excellent. Thank you. And the bitterness and sweetness, does that have more to do with like which teas and how much of them you're putting in? And the sweetness would be how much sugar you've put in there. Like say if I don't want something too bitter or if I do like the bitterness, how can I keep it or well, let go? <laughs> so the different, um, by blending different teas, you can get different flavors. Um, obviously, if you only use black, it's going to be a little darker. The uh, green and black blend uh, typically comes out, like the flavor pro profile is really nice. Um, it really is just based off preference. So the SCOBY is gonna feed off of the sugar and you'll be able to taste that within uh, several days. So it's more about hitting that sweet spot of, do you want it a little sweeter? Do you want it a little more, I mean, like a little bitter, a little more vinegary. So that's why it's so important to try it uh, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, because um, it's it's kind of, a, it's like an avocado. <laughs> Today it's great, tomorrow it's gone. That's a great comparison for <laughs> reference. It really is. Importance <laughs> of keeping an eye on it. Um, one question I definitely want to ask you is how, is there a way to identify whether your SCOBY or the hotel are healthy? Yes. <laughs> so um, the internet's a great resource, um, but Scobies, they kind of, there's several different ones. I've got some really, really beautiful ones. And then I've got some that, you know, they look a little funky. Um, usually, as long as you don't see um, any mold on it, you sh it's okay. Um, I do know some people like to dabble um, very bravely with their first fermentation and they may add other herbs in there or um, some people try um, fermenting coffee. So um, usually for those, those scobies are one and done, and you can typically tell because the color won't be white and it'll be, you know, darker. But for the most part, I would just say look to the internet because sometimes, like, you'll look at it and you'll think, oh, you know, maybe there's something wrong with it, and nine times out of ten, it's perfectly fine unless it's been sitting in really hot temperatures, and you can usually tell. Great. Perfect. Good tip. And... Um, somebody mentioned that they like to cut, that chickens like scobies, maybe a couple words on what to do if you end up having extra scobies and then, and then let's pull back and talk about where I could get a scoby. <laughs> <laughs> so I have heard of people making, um, taking their extra scobies and turning them into treats. Um, usually, uh, to my knowledge, they dry them out. I don't have any personal... Uh, experience dabbling with my scobies outside of making kombucha, I will usually just give them away or we sell them in our kombucha kits. And then um, finding a scoby, we sell kombucha kits at the tea bar in Denver, but if you're a little further away, I would honestly just recommend going on Facebook Marketplace or going on Etsy. Uh, there's so many home brewers out there and with every batch that you make, you get more and there are people just literally giving them away with starter tea. Like you, it's so hard to get at first. And then once you get one, you like, they just, they grow and they grow and they grow and you have so many. Awesome. Maybe get together with some friends and you can make it in succession. I'll make one and pass it, pass it on to you. <laughs> Seems like it could be a good exchange. Um, Excellent. A couple of you have asked if typed instructions will be emailed to you. We will follow up with an email with all of your ingredients and many of the things that were mentioned in the Zoom description. Your instructions and directions are that video. So we'll send a link to that recording and you can reference back to Susan's demo when you're ready. Um, let's see. Uh, maybe questions about caffeine. Does the fermentation change the caffeine amounts? Does it go away? Does it multiply? Like what happens to the caffeine in this fermentation process? I have found that um, usually your kombucha ends up having less caffeine than you start with. So it's um, not a highly caffeinated beverage. Um, you can always for the second fermentation add more if you want it to be more caffeinated. But for the most part, between uh, the SCOBY feeds on the tannins and it feeds on the sugar and it's not, 
overly, it's, you end up with less caffeine than you start with. Excellent. And I also want to mention, you, I know that you answered this question in here, but Susan uses six black tea bags and six green tea bags. Can I use just my favorite tea, the one I like the taste best of? Is that just totally up to me and my preference or does it kind of need to be, does the mixture matter? So um, yes and no. Um, you don't want to use flavored teas, um, including flavored black. So you don't want to use Earl Grey's. Um, you really want to stick with um, pure teas, pure ingredients. Um, the oils in the flavored teas um, can damage the SCOBY. So yes, you can, but it would need to be a pure black or green, or I've done it with a rooibos. I've done it with a white tea rooibos blend, but you just don't, you still have to like, you can't use a flavored tea. So no, um, like I know there's so many flavored teas out there. <laughs> And like, oh, that sounds really good, strawberry orange, but you, you don't want to use those. Excellent. I would essentially make that flavor in my second fermentation if that was exactly. what I was looking for. Excellent. Can you tell us what some of your favorite things are to put in that second fermentation? I, I know you said you don't do it often, you like it as is, but maybe if somebody wanted to toy around with that, what might be a good, easy starting point? I did a green tea mint one that I really enjoyed. Um, I'm not going to lie, it took me a couple of tries. Um, I kept going past the sweet spot and then it was just a little too vinegary for me but um i just added some fresh mint leaves and i um only brewed it with the green tea and then i put a little bit of honey in the second fermentation and it came out amazing um another really good one especially if you want it carbonated um the more sugar the better so sweet fruits like pineapple do really well with second fermentation Great. That's great. Maybe a nice later in the summer, if you're in a citrus place. <laughs> Pineapple um, jalapeno. <laughs> yeah, the possibilities are almost endless. Um, and I want to just remind you that Macy had mentioned that Tutulia teas are pure teas. And so when you're looking for a tea to grab, Macy, I don't know if you have any favorites or you want to call out a few that you guys have on the online shop that are great for kombucha. If somebody wants to kind of jump off this call and get right into it, what should I order? We have um, all of our teas that, that Susan showed in the video. We have that in a bulk pack. So you can buy just pure black, pure green, pure white tea in a 50 count bag. So that's really great for, for kombucha. Um, we also sell in a loose format. Um, the majority of our teas are all pure. So you should be good with any tea on our website. Um, except for that if so Earl Grey, which does have bergamot oil in it, um, to stick with, with the basics, but great. You can find all those on ttula.com. Excellent, and I'm glad you mentioned the loose tea. Susan, I wanna ask one more question about if I'm using loose tea and not a tea bag, how, how would I go about getting those measurements or what's the right ratio? For loose leaf, it's anywhere, it's about two to three tablespoons per, um, per tea that you use. But if you're only going to use one, then I would probably just do the six or five to six tablespoons of the one tea. <laughs> so this mute button always trips me up. So one tea bag is more or less around one tablespoon? One tea bag for us, it's a little under a tablespoon. Okay. So we typically just do two when we're trying to represent one teaspoon. One tablespoon. Okay. Okay, perfect. So maybe about six tablespoons to the gallon. Yes. Cool. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you come? Someone's asking about matcha tea. Is that usable for kombucha? I haven't used matcha for a first fermentation. Um, maybe doing it for a second would be better, but I'm not positive. Great. And um, this is, I think, a good question for a lot of folks out there. Can I half the amount? Can I make a smaller batch? And a, does the oh. jar need to be smaller? Or it can still be big. Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, usually when I make it at home, I double the batch. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, you can, you can do a half batch. It, it'll still have the same results. Perfect. Perfect. And someone has, uh, Yvonne is asking it during the second fermentation, should it be done at room temperature or refrigerated? And I recall that you said not to put it in the refrigerator, but what's the environment we're looking at for storing that can just remind us of that. 
So for storing for the second fermentation, you're going to want to put it in a, a cool, dry place. You don't want to put it in the fridge because um, it will slow down the fermentation process. And the whole point of second fermentation is to have the, the kombucha feed off of the sugar so that it will be carbonated. Um, I find that putting it, I put them in card, like in a cardboard box just in case the carbonation is too much and it spills or it overfills. Um, and then I just put it in my pantry. Excellent. Um, it's best to taste it every day though to test the carbonation because if it does get too carbonated, sometimes those bottles can explode. Yeah. I don't want to scare anyone, but it can happen. Yes, it and it does happen. I might college years experimentation with home brewing <laughs> lost a, a few pieces of glass that way <laughs> so a worth a worthwhile tip um let's see i just found one they're jumping around <laughs> i keep losing them i found a question that i wanted to ask you um okay in the winter how do you keep kombucha at the right time so it's really very cold in your space can you remind us what the sort of minimum temperature we want to go to is? So living in Colorado, even when I do brew and it's colder, um, I haven't personally had any issues. Um, you don't want um, you don't want it to go under forty degrees. I've um, I know people who use like a heating mat and they'll keep their kombucha on there, but I, I maybe I've just been very lucky. <laughs> but um, I we I haven't had any issues. It's just more about, you know, you don't want to keep it in the fridge, but if you keep it in the cabinet, it's usually fine. Or um, I've also put it, like you just put it on your table and it's not indirect sunlight, but it's still getting sunlight. It's usually okay. Excellent. So if you're comfortable, your kombucha is probably pretty comfortable. <laughs> um, okay, this is the question I was looking for. Can you talk to us about alcohol content? Does, does that come out of the game with a little bit of alcohol in it? If you wanted to boost or decrease any alcohol content, is there a way you can control that? So um, I've actually recently been looking into how to increase it. Um, I, um, kombucha, it does have a little bit of alcohol, but it's, it's very, very little. It's not even uh, enough where um, like you have to worry about it with the FDA or worry about it with um, like selling your kombucha. So it's not anything to worry about. Um, that being said, I personally never made a kombucha that was too strong, but I have, we've sold um, some of our vendors kombuchas at our cafe and any like people who are very, very sensitive to alcohol, they may be able to taste it. So I think it just varies on the person, but you could have, I mean, you could probably drink that whole gallon and you would not get drunk. <laughs> not, not with these brewing instructions. Um, in order to make it a higher alcohol content, from what I understand, that is a third fermentation process, and um, you need to get special equipment, very similar to when you're brewing beer. Cool. Cool. Interesting to know. All right. And I'm sorry if we don't get to your question. I want to honor um, Macy and Susan's time here, so I'm going to end us before the hour. And I do want to ask one last question. So. Um, in the first and the second fermentation, when it's done, I believe you said in the first fermentation that you leave it on the counter um, at room temperature. Do you do the same with the second? If I get it to the sparkling place that I want, do I then put it the bottle in the fridge so it'll stop fermenting? So once you hit the carbonation level that you want, um, you would strain, if you used fresh fruit or herbs or um, anything other than just fruit juice, you would strain that out. Then you could just keep it in your bottles and that's when you put it in the fridge to stop the fermentation process. Perfect, excellent. Um, I'm gonna leave a minute or two for the two of you to add anything else you'd like. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Again, everyone who's registered for this webinar will receive an email from me that has links to the Titulia shop, your list of ingredients, and of course this um, as a recording on YouTube. So you can reference back to it if you forget something or if you haven't quite started your kombucha process yet, you can start that way. So I don't know if you two want to add anything else before we wrap this up. I know that um, everyone's all over, but anybody who is in the Denver area and if you don't have a SCOBY, we do sell the kits and um, you can have all of the starter tea you want. <laughs> and can I order from T-Bar online to come pick up at your location? You cannot. Okay. Can I call you? Uh, and 
but you could do um yeah you could call and we could definitely get that set up but just not online for the, the kits excellent so if you're in the denver area give t-bar a call and they will get you set up and ready to go if you're not good luck finding a scoby <laughs> i believe in you i think you can find one i i agree with susan that they're out there um macy and susan thank you so much for joining us today um, i hope you all keep an eye on titulia grab some teas from their online shop to get into your kitchen and i love knowing about that wellness kit i think that's a really cool idea especially right now um, so thank you to the both of you so much for joining us and for your support of Slow Food over the years. We appreciate you and I'm grateful for your time today. Great. Thank you so much. It's great to be a part of it. Awesome. All right. Okay, good luck with your kombucha. When you make your kombucha, tag Titulia and Tea Bar and Slow Food so we can see how it's going and let us know what tea you put in it and what if you're going to do a second fermentation and what you're going to do with it. So grab, find us on social media and tag all of us so we can see your progress. And everybody take care. Thank you for joining us today. And thanks again to the two of you. Bye. Thank you.